So after the amazing success of Kane and Lynch Dead Men, it was a game that was just screaming for a sequel, wasn't it? With its unresolved plot line between the main two characters and ambiguous ending. With some of the weirdest marketing material I've ever seen for a video game, and if serving as nothing more than a tax write-off, IO Interactive released Kane and Lynch 2 Dog Days in 2010. No, not that Dog Days. Though I would rather spend some time with Vanessa Hudgens than this game to be honest. Anyway, Dog Days follows on from the events of the first game, assuming that you took the good ending, though you can hardly tell though because these guys still really don't like each other. The setup is that Kane visits Shanghai to help Lynch out with smuggling guns into Africa for a pommy bloke named Glazer. Lynch? Kane, welcome to Shanghai. Before Kane has even had time to check into his hotel though, he's helping Lynch with a shakedown and of course leave it up to the Inspector Cluzo and the Mr. Magoo of the Criminal Underworld to screw everything up. Good, we got him. He's trapped. He ain't going nowhere. Ah! Turns out that Kane accidentally shoots the daughter of a powerful and corrupt government official, and once their buddies find out, they've got to deal with the cops, Glazer's men, and every other wannabe gangster that gets in their way. In between having a meal, a succulent Chinese meal. A succulent Chinese meal? So they try to escape in between shooting all of the things. And like before, you can expect to accidentally, now I say that in quotations, murder innocent people that just happen to be running in front of you as you're firing a weapon. Like they make the civilians in Virtua Cop look like they belong in Mensa. What's interesting about this story though is that Lynch actually takes more of a center stage than Kane does. In fact, the roles have been somewhat reversed. Lynch is trying to start a new life, kind of, in Shanghai with his new girlfriend. Like he might only be doing what he does best, which is shooting and killing, but we do get the feeling from some of the early cinematics that his head is a bit more screwed on. But then the campaign just turns into that cycle of the main characters blatantly ignoring common sense and making bad decisions over and over. To the point that they eventually have to flee the country entirely in what may be one of the most abrupt endings in any video game. The campaign in this thing will take the better part of two or three hours and aside from what is probably one of the most edgiest torture scenes of all time, it's pretty standard and boring stuff. Won't take long playing this before you notice how unique the whole thing looks. The visual style in this one is just in another league, like it's so bizarre. Basically, Kane and Lynch 2 looks like what would happen if some douchebag first year film student shot the whole thing on a crappy camcorder that he found in a public toilet. Now imagine the film student has a bad case of alcoholism and can't stop shaking and you get the idea. It's also like early YouTube days when people would upload some crappy video with such a low bitrate that you could count the pixels on two hands. There's one cinematic inside a car where it looks like someone's just left the camera recording by accident. And we're just looking at the back of Glazer's head from one of the passenger chairs. Now I don't think Kane and Lynch 2 looks bad objectively, like it's definitely stylistic, but it's a style that just doesn't quite work all that well at times. I don't mind shaky cam if it's done properly, but a lot of the time here it's just kinda not. It really does look like you're viewing the world through some shitty pixelated camera, and there's other weird glitches throughout the presentation that try to simulate this. So there might be a mosaic covering something that's particularly gory or violent, or even something to cover up nudity like those Japanese cartoons that people like to watch so much. During intense gunfights when you're knocked on your ass or when something explodes, the graphics might even get really pixelated and audio can become distorted. Then a bunch of weird artifacts pop up on the screen to kind of simulate this information and data overload. The absolute worst idea though is the way the game shakes when you run. I can still remember playing this with my buddy when the game first came out and he described it as, and I quote, absolute fuckery. And that's pretty accurate. Thank god there's literally a handy cam setting in the game's options to turn this off because it made me feel motion sickness within seconds of playing. So if you want to try this game and you're anything like me, first thing you do, go in there and turn that shit on. It doesn't outright fix the motion sickness but it will stop you from wanting to vomit all over your keyboard. Gotta say though, this game does have some pretty neat looking areas though, like I think the usage of colour, particularly with things like neon signs and lights, looks really appealing. And I mean you can't knock it for not being original, that's for sure. You'll be walking down back alleys and filthy city streets past bystanders who are just going about their business, eating at a restaurant, parking their car or locking their doors. When you're walking down some of the busier areas, it feels like a living, breathing environment, like I've never been to Shanghai, but I'd imagine this is pretty damn close. And as you'd expect when you start firing guns, civilians duck and run for cover. So a lot of effort has been put into these small details and it's kind of easy to overlook. But if you're going to make a game look bad on purpose, at least include the option to turn this off. As a result, if you hate this visual style and it makes your eyes bleed, which is a perfectly normal response, you're still kind of stuck with it. 
At least the sound design is still good though. The voice acting again is of a pretty high standard. And I love hearing Brian Bloom and Jarian Munro, who still sound like the kind of dudes that eat up rocks and spit out gravel. I got him in my sight. One shot. Don't do this, Kane. No. Tell him to let her go. Trust me. Glaze is also voiced by a guy named Jason Connery, who's the son of Sean Connery. I mean, nothing like adding a bit of gravitar to your pixelated, violent third-person shooter, right? Bloody morals! Not to mention the soundtrack and the soundscape, which is just really bizarre, abstract, and kinda haunting. Jesper Kidd missed out this time around, and the music in-game was composed instead by Mona Murr, and some of it is just really atmospheric stuff. Gun sounds are also really good. Sounds like you're firing howitzers more so than it does pistols, shotguns, and rifles, which is a good thing. Being set in Shanghai, there's some guns in here that you don't really see in shooting games all that often. And I had to look up a few of these online just to see what they were. Like a Norinco Type 79? Yeah, never heard of it either. And a QCW05, which is the same gun used by my boy Legion in Rainbow Six Siege. Yeah, it'll sting a lot. All up, I think there's just shy of 30 guns in the entire game, which is a sizable roster, but not as big as your mum's roster. Schwacked. It's a shame then that this game also has maybe the worst shooting controls in any third-person shooter. At least nothing else really comes to mind. Kane and Lynch dog days, more like Kane and Lynch dog shit. I mean, the shooting in this game just feels like ass. Let me put it this way, the crosshair in this game isn't so much of a crosshair as it is a rough estimate of the general directions your bullets are going to be traveling. Sometimes they may as well be leaving the Earth's orbit because that's often how it feels. The crosshair's saying like, yeah, I know you want your bullets to go that way, so maybe they will and maybe they won't. And it doesn't help the crosshair is often the size of a dinner plate. It makes the shooting often a lot trickier than it should be because despite aiming right on someone with your crosshair, the bullets are still gonna go wherever the hell they want. And certain guns you get early on, like the Mac 10 and the Scorpion SMG, are just useless at anything other than point blank range. There are some weapons later in the game that mitigate this, and funnily enough, I found that the pistols are the most accurate and reliable guns in the game. But everything just feels kinda random, and the guns in this are about as reliable as a Civil War musket. I honestly reckon I could fire these guns more accurately myself in real life. Even when you're unloading at someone who's standing so close they could smell your breath, sometimes the bullets just completely miss them. Seems like they tried to make the combat loud and brutal, which it is, but I don't think they thought about how this would affect the gameplay side of things. Hit markers at least help to let you know when you're hitting someone, because otherwise you'd have no idea, as enemies seem to shrug off being shot at like it's a minor annoyance. At least they added a reload and a cover button though, so now you can reload your weapon whenever you want, like every single other third person shooter ever made and you can easily snap in and out of cover by pressing C by default on the PC. So it works like a proper third person shooter, at least when the cover works like it's meant to, you know, by actually covering you. You see, the cover in this game, like try not to think of it as traditional cover you might be used to. Like you're not impervious to damage when you're behind a wall or anything like you might expect. It seems you still take damage to some degree, even though realistically in most of these situations, you're not even exposed. When you take too much damage in this game, you're knocked on your ass and have to press C to get back up. If this happens too many times within a short time period, it seems you're dead. If it happens in co-op mode though, it's a little bit more lenient and you can be revived a few more times. Off the back of that though, I do think this is one of those games that is better when played with a mate. Simply because you're able to both be amazed at how bizarre and offbeat some of the stuff is in this game. Yes, it's that old, it's better with friends argument. Fight me. <laughs> like, I'd probably never had had the time to appreciate how funny the animation is when Kane and Lynch are walking around naked after that torture scene, had it not been for me playing this game in co-op. Might as well be. And unlike the first game, you can still play the campaign in co-op mode through Steam without needing to do any kind of stupid workaround, which is kind of nice. You know what's actually kind of heartbreaking about this game, though, is that it actually could have been really good if they'd just modified a few things. I think if the shooting was more precise, so your crosshair was more of an indicator of where bullets were going to go, and the game was a lot more violent maybe, to the point of what we saw in the recent Red Dead Redemption 2, with dismemberment and so on, it might have had a bit of an appeal as this really intense, explosive co-op shooter. Short lengths for games I don't really have all that much of an issue with if the price is right, but Kane and Lynch 2 on release was charging full price, for a game that also had a pretty much dead multiplayer mode upon launch, at least on the PC anyway. Not to mention that campaign that could be finished in maybe two or three hours and just had no replayability, outside of achievement hunting. 
playing it now in 2018 is just kind of pointless unless you've picked it up real cheap and feel like wasting some time with a mate and blasting through it. It is funny looking back at it though, especially with everything else that's come out since, and I do think that there are games that are a little bit guilty of taking influence from this. So I don't know if it was intentional, but Lynch's look in this is very similar to how Max Payne looked in Max Payne 3. At one point, Lynch wears a very similar looking singlet. He's got a similar looking physique, and he hangs out in similar looking shitholes. The visual glitches and effects, whilst not exactly the same as Max Payne 3, are still kind of reminiscent to the ones in Rockstar's 2012 take on the series. And I still think to some extent that Kane and Lynch 1 and 2 can be looked at as examples of early mainstream games that tried to tell much more violent and mature stories. There's not really all that many games out there that let you play as characters that I think are genuinely bad people. Like Manhunt 1 and 2 come to mind, but that's about it. This game also had a really cool multiplayer mode, which was one that sadly got overlooked. So there was the return of Fragile Alliance from the first game where players would team up to perform quick heists, but had the ability to betray other players to increase their loot. If you did this like a total prick though, the person you killed would respawn as a cop and have the chance to get revenge. Then there was a really cool new mode called Undercover Cop, where each round one player was randomly assigned to be an undercover cop, and had to somehow stop the entire team from successfully completing the heist, without blowing their cover ideally. The trick was that the game obviously didn't reveal who the cop was, and when you shot another player, it wouldn't blow your cover. Overall, the whole thing was really unique, and there's not many games that let you play as an old Chinese grandpa. Getting a game of this going is pretty much impossible though. The only way you can get a match going is if you have a bunch of people to play it with, and then you still need at least four people to create a match, so that's three other people you need to talk into playing it. And then the cops versus robbers modes need six people, so good luck with that. And then even then, if you manage to get a game going, you'll notice how incredibly buggy and laggy matches are, with NPCs and other players just teleporting and rubber banding all over the place. Another thing is that as cool as the concept is, the matches themselves are incredibly short and repetitive. Each map is basically just running to one spot, standing still on the loot for 5 or 10 seconds, then running to the getaway vehicle, shooting whatever gets in your way. The getaway vehicle is going to wait for about 10 seconds before it drives off, and you can either hop in it if you're quick enough, or you'll have to wait until another one shows up. All up, this is supposed to take no more than 4 minutes, and it usually takes around 2 or 3. Then you just repeat this for 3 or 5 rounds, depending on the rules of that server, and that's about it. In between rounds, you buy weapons with the cash you've earned, but once the game ends, it returns to the default weapon loadout. Betraying other people seems fun, and it is initially until you realize it's kinda pointless. Because once you kill someone, they get to respawn as a cop, and you've still got to stand there for 5 or 10 seconds looting their corpse, giving them plenty of time to catch up to you. Loot is also shared between all of the surviving players, so like if anyone dies, it limits what you earn, so there's just no real incentive to betray other people, unless you just want to be a bit of a dick. What's odd too is that there's weapons in the multiplayer mode that don't even show up in the single player. And again, like the single player, the pistols are more accurate and effective than the assault rifles, which still makes no sense. Overall, I think this whole thing is the result of a bunch of guys on the dev team having a fun holiday in Shanghai, taking heaps of reference photos and recreating the areas they visited to make a game out of it. Someone at the team wanted to try something experimental with the storytelling style and the visuals, and they thought it was safer to try it out on a struggling IP like Kane and Lynch, instead of one of their more mainstream ones like the Hitman series. Hence, we got Kane and Lynch 2 Dog Days. It's the kind of game you hate, but you still play it anyway, and underneath a myriad of bad ideas and horrible executions, is also a game that's got a lot of good ideas that didn't quite come to fruition, and there's not really anything else quite like it. As bad as it is, at times it's just a spectacle too and how bizarre and strange the whole thing is. And if it's on sale for a couple of bucks and you've got nothing better to do and a mate to play it with, I'd say it might be worth checking out just for shits and giggles. And you know what, it really does have the best main menu music of all time.